I'm Marla Meal. I'm with the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, but I'm also working on a couple of diversity initiatives that we'd like to talk to you today about, and I'd like to introduce my panel. We'll see if my uh, clicker here, so for all of you, it's the big green button in the middle. Um, Anna Hunsinger is here. Uh, your program may say that it was uh, Lucy Sanders. Lucy was unable to be with us today, so Anna has graciously stepped in to talk about the National Center for Women in IT, NC WIT. And uh, Robin Hauser is here with us. She uh, was the uh, producer and director for the documentary called Code, Debugging the Gender Gap, and we're going to get to hear from her on that in our next project. I'm here to talk to you about women in IT at SC, which is called WINS, and uh, with me is Sela, Sana Bellingham and Julia Stotts, who are both uh, awardees from Scenic for the WINS project. Uh, and I'll also touch on the Internet2 Gender Diversity Initiative, which I partner with Anna and, and Linda and others at I2 on. So uh, we'll have some time at the end for discussion and questions, so I appreciate you all being here. And um, Anna? Good afternoon, and thank you for letting me channel Lucy Sanders, who really wanted to be here. But uh, she uh, just became a grandmother and uh, had to attend to her family. So today I'm here representing um, NC WIT, so I'm honored to be able to do that. But Internet2 is also a member of the National Center for Women and IT, and in fact, many of the Internet2 members are also members of NCWIT. So uh, I apologize, I have a couple of stats that Lucy wanted me to emphasize, so if you see me reading, is because I wanna make sure I capture what she wanted me to capture today. So uh, this is the mission for NCWIT. I love the fact that just those two key words, significantly and meaningful. And to uh, detail this a little bit more, significantly means that there is a lot of work to do. And uh, I'm gonna illustrate this a little bit by a couple of slides here that Lucy uh, wanted to share with all of you. Uh, this one characterizes female percents in STEM fields. And uh, a couple of things to mention is that uh, this is a pass at statistically positioning computing with other STEM degrees. And I think one line that really caught my attention is that bright blue one uh, for computer and information science. And I'm a computer science uh, major. That's what I studied, actually. That's what brought me to this country to study computer science as a female uh, from Mexico. And um, it's interesting that right about the time that I actually, uh, well, I, 1985 to 86, it's interesting to see how that line was, you know, getting close to a 40%. And what's then really interesting is to see where that line is today and compared to other things. Uh, this next slide uh, presents a little bit more of the female percent uh, or percents uh, in select professions. So again, uh, interesting information. And as Lucy would say, the, uh, as part of the mission of NCWIT, the significant involvement of girls and women in computing. Okay, the next word, meaningful. So, uh, in this case, meaningful being that it matters what these girls and women are doing, not just a numbers game, necessarily. Um, I'll give you a moment to see what's in this wonderful slide. Um, this is part of a study that NCWIT did, um, a patenting study, to show women uh, how women are, by and large, not inventing in the IT space, where IT is all of computing. Uh, the bottom line here that Lucy wanted me to illustrate is the purple uh, line, horizontal line at the bottom, where uh, you can see that 87.4 of IT patents from the time frame quoted have male-only invention teams, where a team is um, one or more person, while 2.1% have female-only invention teams, 
and 10.5% have mixed gender invention teams. NCWIT suspects that this is happening because women aren't in the roles that lead to patenting, perhaps a bit of no noticing women's contributions to this. Okay, so a little bit of NCWIT and how they achieve their strategy. Um, this basically gets us to a first part on this uh, specific level that is needed for organizational uh, change. One of the most important things that NCWIT does, among many, but one that um, Internet2 participates, and I know many of the universities that participate in Internet2 also participate, is in their alliances. And their alliances have over 900 organizational members where both women and men from these organizations uh, participate. Uh, it builds a community, uh, creates community forums to which, which to learn and inspire them. So they have a, quite a number of them. By the way, please visit the NC website, which will explain a lot more the different alliances that they have and the work there. Um, I want to, uh, to convey to the something also that NCWIT does, which is to address change leadership and the importance of leadership here, and to also uh, set forth uh, the skills, if you will, that are critical as uh, to create change agents. I, I think another way of putting this is that change agents are not born. They have to be made. They have to be um, connected to uh, not just data, the research, the vocabulary, the practices, and on and on. And this is a very important aspect of what NCWID does, which is to create change leadership and to enable the change agents. Um, open in this sense means to have low barriers to entry, including money. Um, NCWID contributes, uh, as I understand, also financial resources. Of course, they're a membership organization and they support our members, but I believe that about $3 million U.S. dollars are uh, administered by NCWIT and given to also other not-for-profits through different programs, for example, the Seed Funds program and a couple of award programs that they also have. And uh, uh, some of these, um, the funding comes primarily from either private uh, dollars or donations, and, uh, but also from funding from NSF. And if you want more information on some of these programs, I could probably provide it to you as well. Okay, so another aspect of how NCWIT achieves its strategy is through uh, uh, also looking at different approaches to then specific organizational context too. Um, the fact is, is that there's not a case, um, or, or rather, I'm sorry, no one size fits all. So um, a lot of what they do is customization and approaches to working with companies, with organizations to do that. Um, well, there is no doubt that there are tools and approaches that can be utilized across organizations. There are also very unique things that... Um, need to happen in each organization as well. Leadership, values, existing processes and procedures, constraint. So a lot of what NCWIT does is to work with organizations to customize things that will then help that organization or organizations through their alliances too. Okay, another aspect of how NCWIT achieves this too is to also look at change models. So to fill out the change models with all kinds of resources and advice. They do a lot of research as well. Last, uh, they inspire and assist organizations to also take action through programs, campaigns, partnership. And they give you things to do, uh, programs, ways to participate. So these are just uh, a number of these programs, again, if you go through their website, you can see more. Uh, one program that uh, Internet2 actually are starting our work with NCWIT was the Red Share program, which started as a marketing program, but um, also a great opportunity to showcase what you could do through great marketing to provide attention to the issues around diversity and inclusion. So I encourage you to look for a Red Chair 
too, when you can. Okay, so finally, NCWIT also um, provides a plurality of views. Um, as Lucy said when she asked me to do this, uh, she said, it's, NCWIT kind of depends on who's describing it. So uh, I guess I'm describing it today. But it's not too surprising that also you get what you, what you, uh, what you can from this great organization, and uh, the breadth of their mission is, is broad here. Um, like, uh, in this case, you put like NPR. I think what she was trying to put here is a, a little bit that, you know, it has a community focus, works very much with its local, but also at a national scale. Uh, they tell the truth. They research. They look at facts. Um, they put these together. So that's uh, important. They also operate as personal trainers. So if anybody has had a personal trainer at some point, they, they provide personalized, in a way, um, advice. They give advice, often free, if you're also a member, about how to be change leaders and what are the things that you can do at your organization. And last, they're also uh, very much like in an open source type of way. They give the information for free. Membership is free for not-for-profits, which is also uh, important to our community as well. And uh, a little bit more, Marla asked me to cover a little bit. So how did Internet to get involved with NCWIT? It all started through this Red Chair program, which basically is something that we started incorporating in our events. But uh, where we've moved with NCWIT is to now um, sort of get a sense of the state of how both females and males are doing in the IT organization, and particularly as they relate to um, how are females in both leadership but also technical roles in the IT organization. And when we started this conversation, we learned that no one necessarily was actually looking at that, how that was going. Uh, EDUCOS has done some research in this regard, but in talking with EDUCOS, uh, we determined that it would be interesting to see how a small focus set made up of Internet to Universities was doing. So we set in motion over a year ago a survey, a first iteration of a survey to try to understand how the Internet to Universities were doing. The first iteration of the survey resulted in about 60 institutions responding to it. Uh, not uh, necessarily the 330 members, uh, university members of Internet 2, so a small sample, and we are in the process of setting in motion a second phase, another push of this, but we felt it was important to at least get a better understanding of, you know, how are we doing if we want to actually uh, be able to provide recommendations and work in this regard. It would be interesting to also be operating from some facts or some data, so this process will continue, and if you... Um, Pull me aside if uh, your institution participated in the survey. Thank you very much. And if you didn't, I would encourage you to participate uh, because the information will be very valuable to all of us. So with that said, I'm going to segue now to Robin Hauser. Thank you, Anna. Hi, I'm Robin Hauser. I'm director and producer of Cause-Based Documentary Films. Um, a film that I premiered at Tribeca 2015 was called Code, Debugging the Gender Gap. It's funny, I'm looking out at the room, and whenever I talk about do panels like this on gender diversity, I want to run out into the hallway and grab all the men and bring them in. <laughs> Anyone who wants to volunteer, that'd be a good thing to do. Um, especially those men that have children and daughters, right? That's when they really start to care about this. Um, because it's an issue that we all have. I think it's fascinating. My daughter was studying computer science at college, and um, she would start calling home for the first time in her academic career. Uh, she began to show a little bit of inconfidence, and, and um, she'd say, Mom, I'm, I'm failing computer science. I told her that was ridiculous. Go talk to your professor. She said, Mom, this is college. Nobody talks to their professors. But she, as it turns out, um, was doing well. I mean, she was in the top third of her class, but she dropped out after her fourth computer science class. 
um, feeling like she didn't belong. She was just one of two women in a class of 35. The professors really didn't do much to try to encourage her to stay. And this is not something that was specific of the school where she was. This is something that happens to a lot of women um, for a variety of, of reasons. But it inspired me to look into what was happening. Why are so few women and people of color stud studying computer science? Is it just sexism? Is it just a pipeline issue? What's happening? Um, so Code Debugging the Gender Gap premiered at Tribeca, as I said. It went to the White House. Uh, it's, that was for Obama. Um, it, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> it screened um, on Capitol Hill, and it's actually been to over 56 countries at this point. It was humbling, incredibly humbling. We thought that we were making a film that would speak to people in Silicon Valley and maybe Silicon Alley, Silicon Swamp. But the fact that it's gone as far as it has really showed us that we touched upon an issue that women and people of color face, not just in tech, but across industries. But when it comes to education, I think the most important thing that we realized is that coding needs to be taught in schools, and not just a coding class, but it needs to be incorporated across the curriculum. There's no reason why you can't write a string of code and, um, in science class and then visualize how many frogs that you're dissecting have uh, malfunctions in their liver, right? Or bring it into history class and see how many times is history repeating itself. But there's so many ways that you can use code and that actually helps teachers because there's an intimidation factor going on where a lot of teachers don't actually want to teach coding because they know that the seven-year-old in their class might know more about it than they do. So we have to change the idea to make them facilitators and subject dependent, right? So if you're just learning how to incorporate STEM into your classroom, rather than having to teach coding in general. It's much less intimidating, it's much, less, it's much more tangible. Um, so we can go ahead and roll the, the um, sizzle. There will be 1.4 million jobs by 2020 in the computing-related fields. Less than 29% of them are going to be filled by Americans, and less than 3% of that 29% are going to be women. I don't think software engineering is a meritocracy. Being excellent or being good at your job isn't enough if you're a woman in tech. The sort of phenomenon of the programmer has really interested me. Programmer. 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 It's hard to encourage more women to come into an environment that will sexually harass them and not fund them. As soon as a woman gets introduced, it's like blood in the water. When companies started putting these full diversity disclosure reports out there, it became very obvious, wow, there really is a problem. This is something that we need to be trying to address. Women were the pioneer programmers. They've been written out of history, unfortunately. Grace Hopper came up with the concept of real programming languages. Ha, <laughs> coding's magic. I like coding because instead of us being consumers, we could be like a producer. In the same way that everyone should know a little bit about law and everyone should know a little bit about economics, you probably should know a little bit about computer science. Growing up, I was actually a, a system kid. I didn't know that I could learn how to code like so quickly. The reason that there's a gap is actually related to some really real structural factors. Girls aren't encouraged to pursue computer science. They're overlooked because, you know, it's the boys that are good at science and it's the boys that are taking apart computers at age nine. Most students have no exposure to programming. Computer science should be a requirement in all public schools. This is a Rosie the Riveter moment because the jobs are here and we don't have the workers to fill them. For the digital revolution, to truly be great. It can't just be for a certain set of people. I'm hopeful because I think that the tech industry could move the fastest. If we see the problem, we can debug it. This is our country, our cities, our communities, our children, our code. Code. Debugging the gender gap. So Code is available on Netflix and iTunes and Amazon um, now. There's also an educational version. So through our website, which is codedocumentary.com, there's an educational version that's good for middle school and, and younger. Um, and I'm now working on a documentary called Bias, which is about the intersectionality between gender and racial bias. It's really about unconscious bias. Um, here's the thing about bias that's fascinating. We all have it. If you have a brain, you are biased. It means I am, means you are. And in lots of ways, that's protectionary and really important for our lives. And um, in a lot of ways, it actually thwarts our forward progression. Um, and so that is a really interesting uh, documentary that I'm making now. It's, it's hard to make a documentary about something that's so um, 
intangible as unconscious bias, but we're having a lot of fun doing it. And there's a sizzle reel up on our website, which is just biasfilm.com. So thank you very much. Thanks, Robin. I actually get choked up every time I watch that because it's such a big problem. Um, so uh, going on to some activities I'm involved in, uh, the I2 Gender Diversity Initiative is led by Internet2, and we appreciate uh, them taking that leadership role. Uh, we meet uh, on a, a monthly basis or a biweekly basis with the steering committee. Uh, as Anna noted, we have a, a partnership with NCWIT, and they've been involved in a number of our activities. We also work with EDUCAUSE, and uh, we're also uh, working with WINS. We've had some crossover between the two projects that we're going to talk about. Uh, there's also the uh, Society for Women Engineers. I encourage those of you, there are some uh, free memberships that are available. Uh, if you would like to apply for those, Internet2 has made that uh, partnership uh, open to its membership, which is great. And then uh, there have been these GDI scholarships uh, where I2 funds uh, women to go to their global summit and to the, the technology exchange. Uh, and as you can see on the right, that's the steering committee that's currently in place. So I co-chair that with Lori Burns McRobbie, and it's been a great uh, activity that uh, I really appreciate uh, participating in. And they have funded 19 women over three years. Uh, and in addition, there have been uh, 19 women includes some universities that have stepped forward and funded uh, women to go and participate in this effort as well. So we appreciate those universities that have done that. WINS uh, is a three-year program that's funded by the National Science Foundation and uh, DOE through the Energy Science Network. And uh, this was really developed as a means to try and address, uh, as Robin uh, just pointed out this gender gap that we have um, in, in IT. And so this is a, a small, very focused effort. Uh, but part of this panel is just to get you encouraged to think that you can do these kind of uh, smaller efforts as well. Uh, it's an effort between ESNet, uh, their staff have been fabulous on this, uh, Kinber, which is man, uh, run by Wendy Huntoon, is involved, and uh, myself at the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research. And so we target uh, early to mid-career women uh, to get there from various diverse regions. We open it up to all uh, universities and, and corporations and, and not-for-profits. Uh, and we've been able to fund 13 women over uh, two years. There was a pilot program, and we're now uh, through the first year of this program. So our goal was really to provide an opportunity for women to participate in SciNet, which is a, a fabulous activity, and um, Sana and, and Julia will talk about their experiences. Uh, but there's also a problem with women leaving this field. Uh, and so not only do we have trouble getting them into it, but we have trouble keeping them here. And so uh, this was a goal to broaden horizons and hopefully retain women in the IT field. Uh, help them build a professional network, which Wendy and I uh, strongly feel that it helps to have people you can reach out to. And in some cases, women do feel isolated. And so the hope is uh, that they meet other uh, professionals, both men and women, that they can then work with uh, going forward. And uh, to raise awareness. So this is one of the ways we're, we're doing this, these what we call report outs, coming to uh, partner organizations uh, that have, have either had women funded or interested in the topic. Uh, the mentors who mentor these women become much more aware of the issue and how to help women, how to, to mentor them. Uh, the funding agencies have become much more aware of the issue through this as well, both DOE and, and NSF. And uh, SE leadership has become much more aware of some of the issues and, and has really taken up uh, the mantle as well. Uh, and our goal is also to develop new leaders in this field. Um, many of us are aging, and uh, not only women, but men, to get uh, younger, younger people coming in. So just a few of the things that SC focused on that we were kind of proud of. The keynote really focused on diversity and inclusion. Uh, for the first time, SC had child care to enable uh, parents to attend the meetings. Uh, there was a interna uh, internships for diverse students that, that was well uh, accepted. They are very supportive of the WINS program, and um, we'd like to think some of that uh, focus has been because of, of these programs we've had. Uh, and very quickly, we do survey, as part of the NSF grant, um, we do survey the mentors and the participants to see if this has been effective, if it's been positive. As you can see from the results, uh, overwhelmingly, both the mentors and the attendees uh, have found this a very positive activity. And it's just a list of the awardees, and I bring this out uh, mostly to show you that we have gotten great diversity from all parts of the country, different kinds of organizations. Scenic uh, is a regional, but we've also had a number of campuses, large campuses, small campuses. Uh, so 
we are uh, accomplishing what we had hoped there. So um, at this point, I'd like to introduce uh, the, the two women that are here from Scenic. And um, Julia, do you want to come up and, and give some real-world feedback of how it went? Going back, is there any way to go back and forth? Uh, probably that, but I don't know if it's easier. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, it works. So. Um, to start talking about my experience with WINS program, we have to start with about why did I apply for WINS? Scenic has been deploying circuits for supercomputing conference for many years. And um, usually, several weeks leading to SC conferences, we would have this rush of planning, designing, and deploying these high bandwidth, high performance circuits. And I've always interested in knowing what the researchers are doing with these circuits, what kind of technology applications are run on these. And WINS program provided this tremendous opportunity for me to not only attending the conference, but involved in the buildup of Synet and to learn the technologies and have a chance to get to know of more of the professionals in my field to build this professional network. And uh, Senna, who, has, who was a WINS awardee from 2015, we talked about this a few times. She highly recommended the program. And, um, so, and uh, so from the start, I was always trying to um, get into this. And um, last but not the least, I wouldn't be able to participate in Synet without the full support, encouragement, and motivation from scenic management. And of course, my colleagues as well. They had to facilitate the effort in redistributing my workloads, my tasks, and my commitments. With that, I'm, I feel grateful. The teams I joined is the DevOps team. DevOps team um, is the one running the software infrastructure of Synet. They maintain the, uh, the database and maintain all the tools for the other teams. They are also maintain the infrastructure for network monitoring, statistics, and measurement. So it's a pretty big team and uh, has a lot of responsibilities. Um, of course, with Synet, um, in the setup and the conference stage, I was involved in the uh, duties with the DevOps team and Synet teams as a whole. And um, um, my goal is to get to know the DevOps environment, to know the developers' environment, to know the software infrastructure of Synet, and um, to get to know more applications and uh, um, technologies I think that could be beneficial to the home institution. Um, what's unique about WINS is we have a chance to choose whatever interests us to which field you, you are thinking it's, more, it's beneficial, it's going to broaden your expertise to help with your career. I'm not a system adm administrator and coder by trade, but I choose to join the DevOps team because that's, some, that's the area I feel like I want to know more. And another awardee, um, Kelly McLennan from University of Oklahoma, she's a systems administrator, but she, but she chose one transport to be the area she wants to learn more. This is, this is a wins, like the advantage, I think big advantage of wins that we can choose. We, we get to have the chance to do that. And also at the uh, um, at Synet, we another duty is to support scenic associates and uh, pack with customers. At the Synet, um, Senna has done the thorough testing on the WAN circuits scenic and pack we've supported. 
when Zhang um, from SDSC reported that there is a unidirectional issue on the circuit for San Diego State, we were pretty confident that I the issue is not at the one transport site. And um, it was approved when John tested against the Sinat persona box that we determined the issue was between the Sinat knock and uh, the showroom, show, show booth at the San Diego State. And at that time, I, was, went, I, I just went to the routing team, worked with the engineer, cleaned the fibers connected to the Sinat switch. The issue is still there, didn't get resolved. And we were hoping, we really didn't want to get to the patch panels over there. Fortunately, the issue was resolved. It's cleared once we cleaned SFP. So the issue was resolved in a very timely base due to our presence over at Sinet. Before I talk about the benefits and gains, I want to show a few pictures. This is the uh, Sinet knock, what we built from the ground up. And this is a weather map. This is like the most advanced network in the world during the SC conference. And this is our team. At that point, I think um, everybody knows, okay, you have a chance to go to Synet, you, you can learn the technologies, you get to learn the experts, you, you build your, you have a chance to interact with other um, professionals. And um, what I really, really want to emphasize on, not just learning hands-on experience with the software and hardware, I really want to emphasize the people factor, the human factor. Everybody at Synet are extremely busy, but they, they always go above and beyond in helping us with this experience. Show us the ropes, the pros and cons, their experience, and they are willing to share with, with us the codes, the, the schema for the databases, whatever that's going to benefit you as a, as profession, a professional, as an individual, and your institution. And uh, the WINS management team, they have always been caring for us and uh, checking with us to make sure we are satisfied with our environment. Kate Mace, who's at the um, Synet architecture team, architecture team, constantly check, check in with us, make sure we are happy, make sure all our needs are met, make sure um, we have a good experience. And when we, me and Sena, needs to um, have a discussion, out of scope discussion on SDN with, with Ezra, she, at that time, SD conference already started, um, literally all the conference room are booked. She helped us to get the conference room space so we, so we can have a good discussion. And also, the last, lastly, we have a chance to know the other ladies, to get to know some of the other ladies in the technology field. Now, um, everybody can pause for a second. Think about in your institution, how many women are in the information technology department? And how many women are in network engineering? This is a chance that we can um, bond with other ladies in our same field and talk about, get to know each other, our experiences, our achievements, our struggles, and our challenges. And um, I admire them. This is a group of very hardworking, talented people. And uh, I'm grateful and appreciate the experience so that we get to know each other. We have this support group and we, we still exchange information. And um, I want to borrow a phrase that um, from some of the WINS members, WINS members and uh, sign out volunteers that um, 
the Synet, Synet is like a grad school for network, network engineers. But I want to say it's so much more and so much better. That's it for me. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Sana Bellamine. I'm with the Scenic Core Network Engineering Team. Um, I'll just mention that I'm uh, an immigrant from Tunisia. So um, I'd like to start with my um, experience with WINS, with the WINS program. Um, it all started with um, SC15. Uh, that was my first participation with the WINS program. And um, I was lucky to be one of the awardees from, uh, and uh, to join the performance measurement team. Uh, this is a team that focuses on the uh, perf sonar uh, tool suite. So in addition to learning about perf sonar, um, that first year was really beneficial in, uh, for me in learning about the um, Synet environment, the different support groups, how these uh, different support groups interact with each other, um, the tools that are used to support the conference, uh, Central Arts Conference. Um, at the end of SC15, um, I truly realized how great this opportunity was, and um, I told myself if I get to come back here that I really want to make an impact and um, contribute more. Um, so I was fortunate to go back the following year uh, with support uh, from the WINS program and, of course, from Scenic Management. And uh, my SC16 participation was with the full funding with the, from the WINS program, and I was part of the... Uh, um, wide area network team, the WAN team. This is the team uh, that's responsible for uh, bringing up all WAN circuits, all um, external circuits into the uh, show floor. Um, so next, I'd like to explain, uh, I'd like to go over why I was interested in joining Synet. So it has to do with the work I do uh, at Scenic and uh, PacWave. So Scenic and PacWave uh, have multiple associates that have planned uh, high bandwidth demonstrations uh, for uh, during SC events. The typical topology is that a scenic or a packwave participant would have a booth on the supercomputing show floor and from that booth they need to get back to their home institutions uh, and these home institutions are connected to the scenic and packwave backbones. So for that reason, um, Scenic and PacWave typically have a large number of 100 gig circuits into uh, supercomputing. Um, just to give you some ideas here, at SC16, Scenic and PacWave jointly had one terabit into the supercomputing show floor. The total WAN capacity into supercomputing is 3.17 terabit. So the main point I'm trying to make is Scenic and PacWave jointly had about one-third of the total WAN capacity into supercomputing. It's a huge responsibility. So um, for the SC16 conference, uh, I was tasked with planning all efforts around bringing up the West Coast connections, Scenic and PacWave connections, into um, supercomputing. It was a total of seven 100 gig connections, so seven out of those uh, 10. Uh, seven on the West Coast. Um, and uh, I was leading the efforts of coordinating, bringing up those connections, of course, with uh, great support from uh, the Scenic network, network Engineering Team and the uh, provisioning team, the Scenic Provisioning Team. So um, getting into my uh, experience at the C16, so about a week before the conference, we were done with the provisioning, all provisioning aspects of the circuit. Uh, my next goal was to uh, make sure that these circuits will actually meet the bandwidth requirements that are required by high uh, performance computing, by the demonstrations needed uh, that, that were planned by Scenic and uh, Backwave Associates. So when I got to Salt Lake City, um, and as a member of the WAN team, um, I own the task of testing those uh, Scenic and PacWave um, West Coast connections. Um, some, some highlights of this work, about this work. So uh, one thing I was really fortunate um, 
about is that I had access to Synet's uh, expensive 100 gig testing gear. Some of this gear we do not have yet at Scenic. So Synet has very expensive 100 gig testing gear, had access to it, learned how to use it. Uh, in fact, uh, we used it to isolate and fix a problem for one of the Caltech 100 gig circuits. Uh, one of these circuits were having, was having performance issues. Uh, we used this test gear to do a lot of loop tasks and um, we've determined that was a bad connector in LA and uh, we replaced it a few days before the conference started. So at the end, um, it was all um, no issues for Caltech at all. Um, same gear we used to verify and uh, test uh, the rest of the Scenic and PacWave 100 gig connections and confirm they were um, error free. Um, another aspect that was very useful, uh, another aspect of the participation that was really useful for me is um, one thing about Synet. Synet encourages multiple vendors. So I, uh, by being par part of the WAN team, I learned how to use two optical platforms we do not have at Scenic. At the same time, uh, with being part of the WAN team, I assisted with uh, bringing up connections that use the optical platform we use at Scenic. So there was an exchange there. Um, it was a first time opportunity for me. It was the first time I see a 400 gig line card, optical line card. So uh, very latest stuff uh, at Synet. Um, on the non-WAN side of things, as Julia was saying, um, we at Scenic have multiple uh, ongoing projects, refresh, tools refresh projects, and um, it was really a good opportunity to discuss um, like how the conference is supported uh, with the DevOps, the Synet DevOps teams, what kind of tools they use, how the database is set up, and uh, so all the things around um, tool support for the conference. Uh, my last thing here on the slide is uh, one thing I'm very happy and very proud of. It's a collaboration with uh, WINS returnee, Debbie Fligor from uh, the University of Illinois. Um, Debbie and I uh, worked together on testing multiple handicap connections. At the end of uh, this work, we documented the procedure and that procedure is now available on the Synet Wiki and can be used in future uh, supercomputing conferences. Um, not gonna get into details here. This is our testing procedure, uh, very uh, detailed. Uh, one diagram that explains almost everything. Uh, this again was the effort for with, uh, that Debbie and I, um, from work that Debbie and I had done. I think Marla would agree with me here if we say that this is one of the wins contributions back to Synet. Um, and thank you very much for your attention. Yep. So um, we probably have a time for a couple of questions. These were some uh, target questions I came up with in case nobody had questions, but does anybody have any questions for the panelists? Discussion? Yeah, Anna, can you explain that? So, can you hear me? No. How's this? Okay. So the okay. question was, um, can you explain the red chair concept? Yeah, so this started, as I understand, as a, a marketing program to bring awareness to uh, women in technology. And NCWIT worked with, I think, uh, found a red chair if you will, and the red chair symbolizes taking a stand. Uh, uh, one of the people that created this marketing campaign wanted to make a correlation to taking a stand also um, for minorities. So the red chair came to symbolize that if you sit in the red chair, you are taking a stand, either as a woman or a man or uh, to highlight why it's important to be diverse and inclusive. So this red chair, which started as this marketing thing, started showing up in their conferences, and just uh, it's part of a program now called the Sit With Me program, and they, uh, as, as a member of NCWID, you can request a red chair, and they have these red chairs that they send to different places, wherever you may want one, or you can buy one if you want to, as well, 
And it's basically to just bring awareness to the issues. So you can sit at the red chair, you can invite people to sit there to share ideas, share practices, share anything that you would wanna share. So that's part of the program. And I think the one, one of the ones that they're bringing around to lots of, like, they'll bring it to screenings of code, um, is made from 3D printing, oh, right? So it's pretty cool. You. There's a new one, yeah. Other questions? Yep. So to summarize, um, I think the, peop, there, there's a good source of, of women coming into IT through through the military. I guess my question back to you is, you know, when you say uh, find those women, have you found a way to to target that community? Right. Well, and I, I agree with you. I'm not disagreeing. It's just that, you know, most of us open up jobs. Um, and, you know, there's, the question is, is there a specific place that you found effective to post jobs or um, to, you know, uh, encourage that? Yes. So, yeah, so the question was, um, how are we coordinating with other existing programs? So certainly Society for Women Engineers, um, I2, is working with and, and we have worked with. Personally, um, WINS is a very isolated, um, small program, so we're not directly uh, targeting those at this point. Um, Robin, I think you probably worked with some of those groups in, in putting the documentary together, right? Well, or we've partnered with them to distribute the documentary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll, we'll partner with anybody that's interested in promoting women and, and people of color in STEM. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think coordinating, um, these are certainly uh, isolated programs that, that I happen to be involved in. Uh, but, you know, I think these aren't the only programs. And again, part of the efforts here are to just raise awareness so that you do know that there are other organizations out there that are doing things. Get involved, as Les says, or um, start your own programs, um, or, or start Grace Hopper's another one. Um, they have an undergraduate program that, that uh, you know, encourages women as well. So. Uh, our, our point is there is a problem, um, and it's not a problem at any one stage of careers. I think uh, code, again, um, as a documentary, I think covers a lot of these topics really well, uh, that there's problems getting girls into school, there's um, problems keeping women in school, there's problems 
keeping women in IT fields. A lot of women leave the IT field and go into other fields. Uh, and so, you know, there's clearly a, a spectrum you can work in um, across all of these problems uh, to try and try and deal with these. So, yes. Uh, so, uh, my question is for our first speaker. Mm -hmm. So, you showed, you know, the various graphs, and one of them was about, you know, the number of women, uh, you know, going to school uh, in computer science. It was increasing nicely, and then it dropped so significantly. So, is there a good reasoning behind what? You go first. So 1984 was when that one of the highest peaks, and nobody knows an exact reason why women started dropping off. Um, but an interesting theory, and, and I'd love to hear Anna's as well. But a theory that that, that we um, heard over and over when we were making the film um, is that that was the introduction of the personal computer. And well, two things: there was gaming became pretty popular, and gaming was really pr pretty much directed, marketed toward boys and men. Um, and so girls begin to feel marginalized and left out. Um, and also the personal computer, same thing. In most households in the 80s, it was kept in the father's office um, or in the, in the boys' room. Um, and the marketing, the messaging, if you look from IBM's um, advertisements during that time, it was all very much, you know, do you have the right stuff to be a computer scientist or a computer engineer? Um, so it was really societal messaging was that this is something for boys and for men and women began to drop off. Yes, uh, thank you, Robin. Um, I don't have any good answers for that. I just know, I'll, I'll share a little bit of a personal thing. When I came into the field, so uh, coming to the US as a computer science graduate, 1988, I recall, uh, you know, noticing very much the absence of female CS professors. However, I did have two um, as I started that career path. And at the time, in talking with one of them, uh, it was, uh, you know, my question to them was, how come there are so few of you teaching? And by the way, this is 88, and, um, you know, I got, uh, well, there's not that many, but it's good you're studying this, keep it up. And what's what strikes me now is that if you look now at the head accounts too, as you look at computer science departments, um, I think there, the situation is either the same or worse. And uh, just to add to what Robin said, I think it's not just the current environment, the advertising, but is what's happening to the young women too, as, as, as early as elementary school or more. And you know what's preventing them from thinking or being oriented in a way that they could go into that path. And it's just a very different environment too from, from the 80s, right? So maybe we have to change the way that we're also talking and helping those girls that could go into that field. But it's, it's certainly uh, disconcerting to see that drop and you know it keeps on dropping too. Yeah, and if you, if you think about um, trying to push more girls or encourage more girls in STEM, and that there's another problem that's happening in the educational system, and that is that most universities aren't incentivized to increase their computer science departments. They did that during the dot-com boom, and then they, you know, it was a problem during the bust. Um, so the computer science classes in universities are full. They're just filled with men and, and people, um, foreigners, really. So it's, that's one problem. And the other problem is, as you saw in the, in the trailer for the film, is it's hard to encourage women uh, to come into an industry that's going to, or a field that's going to sexually harass them and not fund them. And that's what's happening. Look at, look at what happened just last week or the week before at Uber. I'm sure some of you followed um, Susan Fowler's uh, blog about her experience at Uber. And when you see that this kind of, of microaggressions and in that case sexual harassment is going on in tech companies. I mean these are startups. These are companies that are run by people who are you know presumably 40 or less. Um, so how is there so much sexism or, or you know these really uncomfortable environments and I think that that messaging too why would a girl want to go into an industry where she's going to land in that type of, of, um, of environment? Yeah, I think we're out of time, but I do want to thank the panelists, and I also just want to encourage you to just be aware of this, and I, I do highly encourage you to, to watch the documentary code. It, it has a lot of this information and data in it. Um, 
because, as I said, this is a problem all the way um, through, really, generationally. And, and as Robin points out, it's a male. This is not a woman's problem. This is a societal problem. Uh, we, as a society, will be hurt if we don't get the best and brightest into this field. And so it includes getting more males involved. We have a shortage of IT workers in general. Uh, and so, you know, be aware of that and, and um, encouraging uh, girls. And as I was talking to Dave Reese at lunch, and he says he feels picked on as a white male. Um, what I encourage the white males to be aware of is that what you say and do does make a difference, um, both to women and to other people. The, the tone you set, the, the environment you build, um, hopefully is opening, open and, and welcoming to all of, of our staff that work for us. And so, um, unfortunately, we're moving into a, a environment that's not as welcoming as we would like, but hopefully the research and education community is open and, and welcoming and that we build an environment that encourages women. So thank you very much. Thanks for the panel.